Yeah, I was um, in the homosexual lifestyle, as you were saying. I was quite interested in New Age. I wanted to become a Reiki master. So I was involved in the occult to some extent as well, um, being fascinated by energy. Hello, everyone. Uh, Welcome to our channel. If today is your first time here, our mission is to bring you faith materials that will strengthen and grow your faith so that in the days of adversity, your faith will not fail. And today we are bringing you a testimony of a brother from the nation of Malta. He was an ex-LGBT activist and the Lord touched him. So watch with me and be blessed. So Matthew, your story is incredibly crazy on so many levels, what you are currently facing right now. You're actually facing fines and jail time for essentially discussing your story, sharing how your faith journey led you away from same-sex attraction, from living out that lifestyle. And we'll get into all the ins and outs of, of the story. And But before we do that, I would love to actually hear your testimony of how faith changed you, because that's sort of central to all of this. Uh, yes, that's uh, true, Billy. So yeah, I was um, in the homosexual lifestyle, as you were saying, I was quite interested in new age. I wanted to become a Reiki master. So I was involved in the occult to some extent as well, um, being fascinated by energy. But uh, when I was once invited to go to a church that's uh, different from traditional church that I was used to growing up, uh, I was fascinated by the presence of God, by the love of the people in the church. And I uh, did commit my life to Jesus Christ. He was captured by the love of God, the unconditional love. God didn't see him as a gay. He saw him as his own creation and he was captured by that love. Listen, you man can promise you love and they can disappoint, but the love of God is unconditional. And it, it's been an awesome journey of, of just growing in this new identity and uh, life, really. Um, but I stumbled upon Bible verses on homosexuality one day. I had never heard homosexuality addressed from a pulpit before. But I was really challenged, and I remember just really wanting to be in the will of God and committing committing it to God in prayer and saying, Lord, is this how you see me? You know, it feels natural for me, but I want to know the truth. No matter what it costs, I want to be in your will. I want to be at peace with you. And uh, I, I understood uh, the, the Greek understanding that homosexuality is a practice, uh, according to that Greek word. So if it is a practice and not an identity, then I can leave the practice and not be gay, you know, what society calls gay. I don't have to wear that label anymore. And when I understood that, hope filled my heart, heaviness left my body, and um, I decided to repent from my homosexual relationship and lifestyle. And uh, I quit that, you know, and I started to grow in my understanding um, uh, of, of who I am in Christ, really. So we shouldn't be reluctant spreading the gospel irrespective of who we come across. So, yeah. Was that a, was that a hard journey to, to walk away from that? Because I would imagine it was a big part of who you were, you know, before finding Christ. It's true because uh, some of my closest friends uh, knew about, you know, my declared sexuality back then. So, um, you know, I lost a few friends along the way because, of course, you know, I was not subscribing to societal norms. Um, so, and for me, it was uh, definitely a struggle for me to kind of relate to other men in a godly way now, and especially, you know, to other, uh, you know, brothers in Christ and, and to see them without getting emotionally dependent on them and that sort of thing. So it's not been an easy ride. You know, it's easy to say, well, homosexuality is a sin. Okay. We stop the practice, but we're left with real feelings, real emotions, real thoughts that affect us every day. And that takes renewing of the mind and growing up into Christ. So it has been very challenging, um, but God provides wisdom. He provides grace. And that's the good news. Absolutely. And, you know, you then obviously growing in your faith, you start to, to talk about these issues, right? If there are other people in the same circumstance who are looking to discover faith, or maybe they're at the start of that journey and they have same sex attraction, talking about your experience and your journey. At some point you do an interview 
in the media and you share, and I'm sure you've done many of them, um, and but you share this journey. What did you share during that interview? What, what, what were the contents? Before we get into the reaction of the police to that interview, what did you say? So, you know, these were two presenters in Malta that wanted to know more about uh, the conversion practices law that applies to Malta. They wanted to understand why I view sexuality different differently as a Christian and um, why I would do such a thing, you know, just leaving and forsaking homosexuality altogether as an identity, practice, whatever. And so uh, we were discussing it. Uh, it was scientific. It was practical. It was spiritual. It was a really interesting conversation. So, okay, so that's really helpful because you do this interview and you probably assumed I did an interview, my interview's done, I can carry on with my life now. And then suddenly the police are knocking on your door essentially. So what what happens next? Yeah, so it's uh, I wasn't expecting it because I've, I shared my story several times in Malta, including on X Factor Malta. So uh, that was a, a huge step for me and it was very controversial in my country and, and internationally. But um, this time the police... Uh, give me a call and they say, you know, three people reported you to the police and reported the presenters as well, because they're claiming that you breached chapter five, six, seven of Maltese law, which says, you know, that you cannot advertise so-called conversion practices. And so I turned up to the police station with my lawyer. We exercised our right to be silent. Um, but a few days later, uh, the police inspector decided to press charges against myself and the uh, television uh, presenters. So we literally, you know, had our first hearing in February this year, which was a few months after all of this happened. And um, we're in a criminal court case for the first time, at least for myself. I'm going to speak for myself. It's the first time in my life I have to face a criminal court for uh for simply sharing my Christian faith. That's what it is, you know, sharing the hope that we have and sharing the reasoning behind what we believe. You see, something we must all understand is that we are in the last days. The battle is very fierce. The battle is so tense. As we are pushing, the enemy also is pushing. So watch and pray. I mean, what watch. is so dangerous about sharing your story. People can disagree. They can say they don't think that you did the right thing or that it's it's possible to walk away, that you should walk away. They could say whatever they want, but but I think the step that a lot of people are, are struggling to understand is how you go from disagreeing with what you said to criminalizing it. So just to clarify, because you mentioned what the penalties are under this particular law, what do you face? If you are found guilty of this, what is your worst case scenario legally? Yeah, so so the worst case scenario is that um, I would go to prison for five months, or you know that I would uh, face a, a, a five thousand euro fine in Malta, and um, you know what could happen as well is that if we win it, that the police will choose to appeal it, and it will just go on for longer than we expect. Um, so. I think it's very intimidating towards Christians because I think it's, it can discourage people from exploring the subject, even journalists who would want to hear a different point of view. You know, th this is creating a lot of stigma and intimidation in society. It's it's terrible. It should, these laws should have no place in any nation. Well, it's especially in nations that, you know, are supposed to uphold free speech and expression, right? I mean, when we talk about the West and we talk about countries where, you know, we should be able to say things that are controversial that people don't like. We should be able to have those conversations. I believe the same for, I'm a Christian, for people who aren't Christians, that they have the right to say what they want to say. What is, what you just hit on though is very interesting here because when stories can't be told, it becomes very troubling. We see this with people who detransition in the transgender movement, right? Those stories are often not told. But, but what you're speaking of too, because these presenters being brought up on charges, that means the people exploring the issues have no right to ask any questions about them either. I mean, that that is deeply troubling. To your knowledge, has anybody else been in a similar situation to you under this law in Malta, or is this the first case like this? Uh, well, yeah, good question, Billy. Uh, this is seen as a test case, but what's even more worrying is that as the court case is proceeding, 
um, the LGBT lobby is already making plans to make the law stricter in Malta. They're frankly annoyed at the fact that the advertising uh, clause in the law is not strong enough to in to send us to prison or whatever because um, they want it to include promotion and every kind of promotion just so they can perhaps have all the interviews removed from the internet so that people have, don't have, even have access to this level of information. So it's a lot of control. It's a lot of control. And so like they couldn't have made it more obvious that they're using this case to get to the next level of legislation. This is simply them desperate for a case so that they can strengthen you know what they're doing in terms of you know legality against us what kinds of free speech and religious freedom do you have there in malta yes so i would say they're uh, standard um laws like similar to the us you know we we, we do have uh, our our constitution the highest law of the land which protects our freedom of expression uh, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. So these are deeply uh, held uh, values in Malta, traditionally speaking, that our forefathers fought for. You know, so um, what 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 has been happening though is that the the Holy Spirit has been really moving in Malta and shifting the nation from religious bondage and tradition to the power of the Holy Spirit, these last few years, especially, you know, these last 15 years, I would say. And it's been impacting society and all of Malta knows about my church um, and my pastor as well. So we happen to be a very influential, uh, spirit-filled church that's impacting the nation, nation in an apostolic way. And so there is a lot of resistance. You know, these LGBT forces have been very hostile towards myself, my pastor, our church, you know, because we're vocal and, you know, we we t we speak it, you know, we speak the truth in love, but we do speak the truth. And yeah. so that has been creating tension between darkness and, and light. And we have also been seeing a political movement, a traditional political movement that's becoming more and more progressive, so to speak, liberal, uh, anti-Christian, you know, going for anything that is against the word of God. So there are demons to be fought here, you know, and it's a spiritual battle. We can really sense it and feel it over the island. But God, uh, we believe, is going to bring revival in our island, um, a, a spiritual awakening and access to governmental realms. And so we're feeling the tension right now, but we have hope in Christ. No, that, and that is, that part of it is incredible. I mean, what would you say to those who, I mean, look, a lot of people on this issue, they struggle to understand, right? They might look at your story and look, you know, God can do anything. There are people who may never experience same-sex attraction again. And then there are other people who choose to step away from it, right? From, the, from living it out, but they are still going to have same-sex attraction. And so how would you help people understand that piece of, of the puzzle? Because I think there's a lot of miscommunication there too when we talk about conversion and all of this, where, where the secular world just doesn't really understand what might be going on in a story like yours. Right, uh, yes. Yeah. So I think people are generally uh, very interested in that. I think I... I don't expect people who don't have the spirit of God to fully understand my reality and the way I present it because, you know, we're used to speaking faith as well. You know, we speak the, those things that are not as though they are. So our language, um, you know, is what it is. But I, I think I've been, uh, I've been very real um, and just understanding the difference between position and experience and the importance of us speaking from our position in Christ and um, and affirming that. So, yeah, I, I think I, I speak of it as something that is not fixed and inherent, but something that is more of a, of a temptation, you know, because sometimes we, we speak of same-sex desires as, as something that is so part of us, you know, and, you know, uh, and I understand, you know, it's a process for everybody and everybody responds to it differently based on their coping mechanism, their background, their personality, their growth in Christ, you know. Um, so, yeah, um, I think the church 
responds differently from the world because uh, I think it's it's a gospel issue, actually. You know, people are thought, well, if you're born that way, you cannot change. It applies to everything, not just homosexuality, for somebody who's secular in their mindset. So I would say it's broader than just homosexuality. This is a gospel issue. Can human beings change? You know, can they go from darkness to light? You know, can they break free from addictions that have held onto them for so long? And the gospel offers hope for, you know, those addicted to drugs, those who are sick, you know, uh, any any chain can be broken. That's the gospel that we preach, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's... That was really helpful. No, that's that's super helpful for you to explain. And and we need to just really remain uh, bold and, and uncompromised in our witness, right? Come on, beloved, run to him, run to Christ. He still loves you. He loves you in the midst of what you are going through. He still sees you as his own child. He's willing to embrace you. He said, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. At any time you return to him, his arms are open to warmly welcome you back. Jesus is waiting for you.